Good morning, Mom and Dad. Good morning. Good morning, Bill Ling. Good morning, everybody. How are you? The, the political portion of this broadcast is done. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can all hear me, so I'm going to go without the mic unless somebody wants me to put it on. And we'll just see how this goes. My wife is at the... Uh, she took my daughters and my sister and my niece, and they went down, and they're doing... Well, it's a place where I grew up uh, on vacation down in the Rogue River. And uh, to this morning, they're on a jet boat. And I know they were up early because I got a receipt from Starbucks saying they reloaded my Starbucks card. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't called me to say happy birthday or good morning, but they got the coffee. All right. Okay, let's open the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love and for your grace. We do thank you that we have the opportunity to come together, quiet our hearts walk away for a little bit from the cares of the world, focus on the, something we should care about more than anything else, and that's your word, what your word has to teach us. As we finish up chapter 10 here and move into chapter 11 in Romans, that we would have an understanding of the dispensational change that has happened and have an understanding of exactly why you did it, when you did it, and the fact of are you done with Israel or are you going to continue to deal with Israel? We do thank you for your love, and we thank you for your grace this morning. In your son's holy, precious name, amen. Okay, I said last week that we were going to that we were done with chapter 10. There's a couple things I want to clean up on that before we move into chapter 11. Um, so let's just pick it up in Romans 10. And verse uh, 19. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to, my, reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Okay, so they said, I want to finish up with a couple things on, on the issue of the end of chapter 10. I'm going to try and remember to stay in front of this microphone. One thing I want to bring up is, well, I've said many times, 9, 10, and 11 are really the best commentaries you're ever going to find on what was going on in the book of Acts. Okay, Paul is, Paul is really laying out the issues in the book of Acts here. We'll see that in, in great detail when we get down to 11, 11, 12, 13, and there. What I want is to be sure that we understand, and, and this is where really the Acts 28 position will come from a lot of times, or the Acts 2 position, is people will take Paul's epistles and look at them through the, through the microscope or through the lens of Acts. And that's backwards. You want to take the book of Acts and look at it through the lens of Paul's epistles. Okay? We want to come to Acts and understand what's going on in Acts when we read what Paul says is going on in his epistles. Acts is not our book of doctrine. Romans through Philemon is our, act, is our uh, books of doctrine. Paul will tell us what we need to know as we, as we, Paul will tell us what we need to know as we walk through as we go through Acts. Unfortunately, so often what happens is where bad doctrine comes in, is people will take Acts and then try and put Paul's epistles into Acts as in as if Acts is the doctrine that we're going to do and then we just fill in the gaps with Paul's epistles. And that's what he's laying out here. It, a couple things I want um, 
to look at. Look at chapter 10 and verse 19. We looked at this last time. He says, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Okay, we looked last time at that foolish nation. We saw that's the little flock, that believing remnant that's going to go through the tribulation and come out Jesus' people at the end of the tribulation. Okay? They're called a foolish nation. They're called no people because that's what, it, that's what the apostate nation of Israel would look at them and think what they were. They think they were foolish. They're foolish for following that carpenter's son. Okay, it's not God calling them foolish. It's the apostate nation calling them foolish. But if you look over at chapter 11, verse 11, he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Let me draw something here. Today, in the dispensation of grace, and, and really this is this is really talking about, well, it's talking about, this, about what's going on today too. Today they're provoked to jealousy, not by that little flock who doesn't exist anymore but by the dispensation of grace and by the church of body of Christ. Okay? The Bible-believing Jew is going to look at the church of body of Christ at Paul's unique apostleship, and he's going to, they're going to hopefully be moved to emulation. Okay? If you look at chapter 11, verse 13, at the end of the ver or verse 14, after he declares his apostleship, he says, If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. They should be provoked to be saved today because of what God's doing in dispensation of grace. In time past, it was that little flock, right? As G Jesus was trying to, when he was on the planet in the 12, he was trying to call out that believing remnant out of the nation, that foolish nation, and he was going to deal with them. And those are the people that are, we, we saw last time are going to receive the kingdom. In time past, they were provoked to jealousy by that little flock. That's Acts 1 through 12. Now, they're provoked to jealousy by the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And in the book of Acts, that's going to be chapters 9 through 28. So you have a little overlap there, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Okay? Now, the other thing we, we looked at, we saw this, and I don't know that we, we talked about this in a, in a proper setting. Look over with me, if you would, over at Isaiah 65. Yeah, which, uh, it's at the microphone. You're at the, we'll, we'll go with that one. Look, Isaiah 65 and verse 1. It says, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all day into a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Okay, that's what Paul's talking about there. Look over, if you would, at Isaiah 8. I'm bringing this back because it's, we want to be, have it firmly in our mind that that nation that Paul's talking about, that foolish nation, those people that are not a people are not Gentiles. Because that's what's commonly taught out there. So then the question is, well, what nation is it? And of course, what's the response today? Oh, well, clearly that's America. Well, what about 300 years ago? Or at the time Paul wrote the thing? Look at Isaiah 8 and verse 11. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, let him be your fear, let him be your tread. He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble, and fall, and be broken, and be smared, snared, and be taken, bind up the testimony, seal the law among thy disciples. Okay, and so he, he goes on, jump down to verse, chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, 
and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Okay, the people that didn't seek him, the people that, that, that have seen this great light, they walked in darkness, they saw a great light. Who are those people? They're, they're the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali in chapter in verse one there. Well, in the in, in, no, they're not they're not the little flock. Yes, they become a little they become a little flock. You're right. This is Jerusalem. Samaria is up here. He's talking about the northern kingdom. Okay, the people in Jerusalem, they look at those people up there in the north as not a people going all the way back to the time of Nebuchadnezzar when that those, uh, those northern ten tribes got taken away. Come with me to Mark 4, Matthew 4. You can see Jesus deal with them. Matthew 4 and verse 12. Then when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. We just read about Galilee of the nations. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast on the border of Zabulon and Nephtalim. By the way, those are two of the twelve tribes, if you don't know who those, those are that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Okay? Jesus goes into Galilee because they're the people that see the light. Eleven of your twelve apostles came from the Galilean area. The only one that didn't was who? Judas. Judas, he's, he's from, apparently appears to be from Judah or, or Jerusalem. This is a time where he's, Christ has actually given up on the Jewish leaders, right? That's exactly and right. He's, he's leaving up for personal ministry. Matthew, yeah. Matthew re presents Jesus as the king. Chapters 1 through 13 is the presentation of the king. From 13 on, you see that rejection. You start to see it here because Jesus... He goes up to Galilee and he says, you know what, they'll hear it. Now, it, it, it's called the Galilee of the Gentiles, it's called the Galilee of the nations, because they look up, the people in Jerusalem, they look up there, those aren't any people. We're God's people. So he goes up there and they hear it. They weren't seeking him. Think about the Seraphonician woman. She knew who she was. But when God, when Jesus got up there, she recognized him. But she understood salvation was in Jerusalem. Just a quick question. Yeah. So, like you said, Matthew, he was Jesus was presented as king. Mm -hmm. That's before he went to the cross. Uh -huh. right? So, in the dispensation of grace, how would you describe Jesus presenting himself as Savior? As It's interesting. It's a great question. Come with me to 2 Timothy. Jesus, Paul presents Jesus. The question is, Matthew describes Jesus as the king. Uh, and I'll, I'll add to the question a little bit. Mark as the servant, Luke as the man, and John as God. And those all line up with things that Israel had been told. So that, that fourfold presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why the, the Gospels are not in chronological order. That's why that, that fourfold uh, re revelation of Jesus Christ, according to prophecy, should should have meant something and it does mean something to the little flock to Israel as they go through it so the question is well how does Jesus present himself to us today and more than anything else as as our savior and then as the head of the body of Christ right we are the body he, he is he is the head he, over there in, a, in Colossians and Ephesians now there are people that will say will say though you should never call him that he's he's never king today He's never identified as being the king today. Where did I tell you to go? Go to 1 Timothy. And I, you want to be real careful with that because the presentation of Christ as king is clearly and truly to Israel. 
but that does not mean he's not king today. Jesus talked, or Paul talks many times about he reigns. He's far above all principalities and powers and, and heaven, might, dominions, and every name that is named. Far above geographically, but also far, far above militarily, if I can put it that way, or in order, right? Forget the person that holds the office. The, the, the person that's above everybody in America is the president. Right? And, and, and so it's that kind of thing. But it's also ge in that passage geographically. But look what Paul says here. Look at verse uh, 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to, to save sinners of who I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Okay, I was the chief of sinners. I was not savable. Jesus Christ had mercy on me. He came down. He brought in a new program, revealed it to me, and I'm the pattern for the rest of the world to be saved. And now he's the head of the church, the body of Christ. That's not what he says. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So there Paul calls him the, Paul, Paul calls him the king. So he is Israel's king in that he's going to be sit in David's throne. But he's the king over the universe. So don't, don't let anybody come along and tell you, well, you shouldn't call him king in the dispensation of grace, because Paul did. After he gave a great testimony about how he couldn't be saved and how he was saved, his first response is, not, and this is Timothy, right? This is at the end of his ministry. He doesn't run out and say, make sure you don't call him king, make sure you call him the head. He says, oh, he's the king and the great God. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So he can be identified that way. Functionally, he is today our Savior and our head. And that's what we're learning about in our Colossian study right now, is not using human viewpoint and philosophy and all that uh, in our Christian walk, but to keep Christ as the head, the head of his body, which is the church. Did that answer that? Yeah. Okay. The, the Gentiles of the nations, the, the, the Gentiles, that's the northern part of Samaria. They saw the light. They, they didn't seek after God. They didn't necessarily ask for him. But that believing remnant that was up there saw the light. You can see it again in that Sarah Phoenician woman who was a Gentile, but she saw what was going on up there. But you, you go back and you read, and you see he had, they have much more success in the northern part of Israel than they ever do in the southern part. Okay? We're in 1 Timothy. Look over at 1 Thessalonians 2. The darkness remained in Jerusalem. That's what Greg was just saying. Yeah, he didn't have success in Jerusalem, so he went to the north, and they saw it. Because, and, and why did he go north? Why did he go? Why did he give up on Jerusalem, or or, or, or be done with Jerusalem and go north? Do you guys remember why? We just read the verse and told us why. Fulfilled prophecy. There he is. To fulfill prophecy. This is probably not how it happened, okay? But let me just talk about human nature. And Jesus Christ was human, right? He's down there, he's working, and he, in, in, he's, he's, he's doing what he's doing, preaching the gospel of the kingdom in Jerusalem. They're not hearing him. He says, you know what? There's a prophecy back there that says, I'm supposed to go north, and off he goes. Fulfill prophecy. Now, Jesus didn't think like that, okay? I understand. That. That's just human. But everything he did was to fulfill prophecy, or more specifically, to fulfill what? The Word of God. The Gospel. Yeah. Really. yeah. He had to do it. He had to go to the north, because that's where the people were going to receive the light. That's what the prophecy had said. He came to Jerusalem, where the leaders were, where the leadership was, right? The, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the, prophecy, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and, and all those people, the Herodians. They rejected him, so now he moves to the north. Now, he has success up there, but not great success. Most of those people turn away from him. And he starts talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and they say, no, we are out of here. And then he asks the apostles, who do you say that I am? And they come up with all kinds of answers, don't they? John the Baptist, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets, Elijah. And he looks at his 12, and he says, well, who do you say that I am? And what they say? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That they got that they're that little they are representative of that little flock that believed. Now, 
if you go back and read that passage, Jesus tells Peter that it was revealed to him by the God the Father. So Peter got that by divine revelation. That's how everybody's going to get that. They're going to they're going to believe or they're not going to believe. And if they believe the scriptures and believe Jesus, then they're going to they're going to come to that understanding. Okay. Uh, so what what I want to get at as we move into chapter eleven is when Paul's there's a diminishing that goes on in the book of Acts. Okay, the, the, we're going to look at this in detail when we get over to, to chapter 11. Uh, but they stumble at the cross, they, they fall with the stoning of Stephen, and then there's a diminishing all the way to Acts 28. Okay? But that, at what happens with Stephen, with the stoning of Stephen, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that is the judicial pronouncement on the nation. There's no more offer of the kingdom to them. They just, it just has to, the diminishing has to happen. But at that moment, God has set them aside. He has cast them away. He still has to deal with the people that are on the planet. But that program's no longer, the, the judicial decision's already been made. And you see that. First Thessalonians is one of the very first books Paul wrote. And look at First Thessalonians 2, verse 14. For ye, brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they pleased not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. So he says, he's come to the Thessalonians, they're struggling, they're per being persecuted, and he says, you're following those churches in Judea. Not their doctrine. He's not saying you're following their doctrine. They're following in the same way. Just what exactly what he says. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. The little flock, that messianic church, was getting persecuted by the apostate nation. First we saw it with Saul. Well, then Saul leaves, and then you know how they had others that were coming along and doing that. And Paul's telling the Thessalonians, okay, you're going through the same thing those churches down there in Judea are going through. Not, it's not a doctrinal issue. It's a physical, the physical persecutions that they're both suffering. Look at verse, the second half of verse 16. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. As soon as Acts 7 happens, they are cut off. They are cast away. Now God's going to deal with them again. But you can see right here, this is why I said earlier, we don't let Acts define Paul's epistles. We use Paul's epistles to let us know what's going on in Acts. This verse tells you that God's not dealing with Israel anymore. At the time Thessalonians is written, God is no longer dealing with the nation of Israel. He has set them aside. The wrath has come upon them, who's that, the Jews, to the uttermost. Now, you can see this happen. You can see this happen in, 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 the book, in the book of Acts. Come with me to Acts 22. Acts 22 and verse 17. Now, uh, Paul's going to give his account. He gets saved and then he goes um, he goes into Jerusalem about three years later. And Paul, this is Paul's going to give you his account of Acts chapter 9, verse 26. Okay? Verse 17. And it came to pass that I was come again to Jerusalem. Even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. For they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am imprisoned and beaten every synagogue, them that believed on me. And when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto the death, and kept the raiment of them and slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Paul understands in Romans 9 he's already been sent to the Gentiles. Okay, now we're going to look at three things in the book of Acts that people say, see, it's just, it's slowly going. And that's not what's happening in the book of Acts. What I want you to see is Paul's understanding 
of the dispensational issues with Israel are that once Paul got saved, God was done with Jerusalem. You see in verse 9 there, what does he say? Or verse uh, 18. They will not receive that testimony concerning me. They're not going to hear you, Paul. That's not their program. Don't go in teaching them the kingdom because they're not going to hear you. And Paul, you're not teaching the kingdom. Because Paul, you know what? I'm sending you the Gentiles. And now watch, watch, watch this, this, this happen. Look at Acts 13. Try and do this with this thing. What do you think the chances are I walk into that? <laughs> Looking pretty good, huh? Pretty good. All right. If I fall on the floor, somebody pick me up. Okay, Acts 13, verse 44. Now, here's Jerusalem. Okay, Paul now, he's in Antioch. Of Pisidia. Okay. Acts 13, verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled. Uh, Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Okay? Look over at chapter 18. Now Paul's in Corinth. Jerusalem. Here's Antioch of Pisidia. Here's Corinth. Verse 4. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. When Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. When they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Now we've already seen that Paul, Paul's opinion of this was he was sent to the Gentiles all the way back in Acts 9. But in Corinth he says, all right, I'm going to the Gentiles. Now look at Acts 28. He's in prison in Rome. So Paul brings the brings the the leaders to him in Rome. And uh, look at verse 23. When they appointed a day, him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expanded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses, out of the prophets, from morning till evening. Some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. When they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go on unto this people, and saying, Hear ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross. Their eyes are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they, their eyes have they closed. They closed their own eyes. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Now the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. He's not saying uh, that it's, it's going to be sent. He's saying it's already sent and that they are hearing it and that they will hear it. That was wrong. What I want you to see here, though, is Jerusalem's supposed to be the center, correct? And according to prophecy. Okay? Paul sets up headquarters in Antioch. Okay? This is Antioch of Syria. He sets up Antioch of Syria. But when he goes out, what does he do? He declares here, in Acts 9, when he's recounting this, and that's the road to Damascus, he's told to go to the Gentiles. He gets to Antioch, a Pisidia, he declares it again. He's going to the Gentiles. This is Asia. He gets over here to Corinth, that's Greece. He declares it again. He gets over here to Rome, Europe. 
the known world at that time. And he says, we're going to the Gentiles. You see, as, as the book of Acts goes, it gets further and further away from Jerusalem, his declaration, and he's getting out to these Jews that are in these lands and giving them an opportunity. And he says, you can see, salvation was supposed to be in Jerusalem. He's not offering these people the kingdom because what difference would it make if these people received the kingdom? The kingdom's not in Asia, Greece, or Europe. Where's the kingdom supposed to be? Jerusalem. He's doing this, death, and as, as, as it goes on, he tells these people, and they reject it. He says, okay, we're going to keep going. He tells these people, they reject it. You can see the manifold wisdom of God. He's just declaring to these people that are out here, we're going to the Gentiles. Salvation is no longer of the Jews. But it all starts in Acts 9. God is not dealing with these people according to the kingdom program anymore. Jesus gave them up here when he went to the northern area. When they stoned Stephen, God made that judicial pronouncement. Paul's going out here trying to get these people saved. They can't get saved according to the kingdom program anymore. Plus, it wouldn't make any sense because the kingdom's not here. You go back and read prophecy, God says, I'm going to bring my, bring my people back. I'm not going to set up a kingdom in, in Asia. God, so Paul comes out and he declares to these people out here that salvation has now gone to the Gentiles. That began in Acts chapter 9. I'm going to be very clear about that so we understand what's going on in these verses. Go back to Romans. Any questions about that? Go back to Romans 11. Does that make you understand, understand what Paul and, and, and God is actually doing? He's going, he's, he's reaching these people. They, these, these people are not part of the kingdom anymore because they, they can't be. Israel, nationally, has been set aside with the fall of Israel. So even though they weren't in Jerusalem, they, they, they've, if they're not believers by this time, they've still been set aside. We've read these things about the uh, before the uh, diaspora happened, before Paul shows up and, and, and look at Acts, uh, Acts 6. <clears throat> you know, sometimes God says it better than I can say it. Acts 6, verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Where is the Messianic church growing? Jerusalem. You see that? The word of God increased, the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Okay, and then if you come over to chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was consenting unto his death. That's Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, because that's where everybody was. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Who? Except the apostles. Why do the apostles stay in Jerusalem? That's where the kingdom is supposed to be. They're, they're waiting for that. The rest of the disciples, they went into this area. But these people out here, they were declared in unbelief as well. So Paul goes up and, and uses their scriptures to prove that Jesus is the Christ. And then he gives them the message of salvation that he preaches to us today. He never offered them the kingdom because it wouldn't, again, it wouldn't make any sense. The kingdom is, at this time is no longer being offered. Plus, it wouldn't make sense to offer it to those people that were out there anyhow. Okay? So with that in mind, that's the understanding. So now when we come to chapter 11, we understand, okay, Israel's been cast away. That's what Paul has told us in chapter 9 and 10. So look at verse 11. Or, yeah. I'm sorry. Chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid... For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture say of Elias, how he make intercession to God against Israel, saying, Okay, so I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, or no. Okay, look over at verse 15. For if the casting away of them be in the reconciling of the world, which shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Well, which is it, Paul? Are they cast away or not? 
the verse 1, he says, well, God forbid. But in verse 11, or verse 15, he says they have been cast away. The issue you're talking about is verse 15. He's talking about them nationally. In verse 1, he's talking about them individually. Now, how do I know? Because what Paul tells you. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Is Paul saved at this time? Paul saved at the time he writes Romans 11, right? There's the evidence. There's the evidence that God is not done with the individual Jew right now. Paul says, I'm an Israelite and I got saved. Verse 15 is talking about the national issue. And then he goes in and we talk about the root and all that. What I want you to see, though, is the issue is God does not cast away the individual Jew. He declared them all in unrighteous in uh, ignorance that he might have mercy on them all. Verse 2, God hath not cast away his people which ye foreknow. Why ye not you? <laughs> what ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how we make an intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed my prophets, dig down thine altars, I am left alone, they seek my life. Or what saith the answer of God unto him? I re reserve to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Come with me, if you would, to Psalm 94. Psalm 94, verse 1. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, showeth thyself. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things? And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. This is the cry of Israel to their God as they're going through the tribulation. They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. It looks like God's cast them off. This is a prophetic scripture where that little flock is going to cry out to God and say, it looks like you've cast us away. Even, though, even they say it. Verse 7, yet they say, the nations, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it, uh, that apostate nation of Israel. Understand, ye brutish among the people, this is not about the nations, this is about the apostate Israel. Ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that, right, look, look God made you, made the creation. You, you, do you really think he's not seeing, not aware of what's going on with his people? He that chastiseth the heathen, the heathen, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall not he know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. We're speaking about the little flock there. That thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. If they'll rely on the Lord, God will give them the rest as they go through. And that when their enemies get thrown into the pit, verse 14, For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart will follow. Uh, who will rise up against me for the evildoers? And, and on he goes. What I want you to see there is it looks like God's given them up. But God has promised to not cast away his people. So even with Israel, once he cast the nation away, he didn't necessarily cast the people away. He still gave them a way to get saved. That was Paul's heart for them, that he would get Israel saved. Now, nationally, it can't happen nationally. It can only happen according to the dispensation of grace today. Okay, And even back then when Paul was writing this. 
Go back to Romans, Romans 11. We're going to go look at this, at this issue with Elijah here in just a minute. But in verse 2 he talks about um, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Look over at Romans 9 and verse 6. We spent a lot of time going through this passage. I just want to bring it back into your memory. Romans 9, 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. If God has cast away his people forever, then what we just read in Psalm 94 is of none effect, isn't it? And God says that can't happen. My word does work. But they're not all Israel which are of Israel. He's talking about the little flock now. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither have done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Well, if the, if the word of God works, then maybe he's just unrighteous. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. There's that issue of the people that he knew. God, God foreknew that there was going to be a group of people he calls the little flock, the believing remnant in Israel. He's not going to cast Israel off because he knows those people are going to show up again out here. The people that he foreknew, he's not going to reject. He's not going to cast away who he foreknew would respond to the gospel. Now that we're talking about the gospel of the kingdom in the context here. Okay? So let's go look. Go, turn with me if you would to 1 Kings. 1 Kings 19. First Kings 19 and verse 18 verse uh, uh, verse 9 verse 18 that's the issue where Elijah he goes up 450 prophets of Baal and himself and he call and he's you know he they, they build the altar and Elijah says okay guys call your call Baal have him, have him burn up your, 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 your offering and they can't get his attention right so then he starts mocking them maybe he's asleep yell a little louder maybe your God's asleep maybe he's on a far journey yell a little louder get his attention and then hey, what does Elijah do he calls to God and what's God do not only is it the altar there but it's do, just just drenched in water, right? God sends the fire from heaven. Whoa! Everything's gone. And then Elijah calls for the death of, of the Baal prophets. Well, that makes Ahaz, Ahab and Jezebel very angry. So look what Jezebel says. Uh, Ahab told, verse 19, 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do it to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by the morrow about this time. When he saw that he arose, went for his life, came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. Jezebel says, I'm coming for you. You got 24 hours, you better get out of town. And it says, if I don't get she says, if I don't get you, then maybe may the gods get me. And that's eventually what, what does happen. It's interesting to me though, Elijah just saw what happened. Jezebel gets him on the phone and says, I'm coming for you, and he runs. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting how, how quick that change? You, wouldn't you think if you'd just seen what Elijah saw and, and did what Elijah did, that you'd say, bring it on, Jezebel. I'm ready for you. My God is devouring fire. That's what we just saw. 
So anyhow, he turns and he runs. And uh, let's see. Uh, verse, verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. He said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. The Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, but after the fire a still small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face on his mantle, went out, stood in the inner end of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets and sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return unto thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, when thou comest. And so it goes on, and then look at verse uh, 18. Yet have I left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So you see what happens? He's on the run. And Elijah thinks, I'm the only one. I'm the only one left. I look out at my nation, and everybody has rejected God. And I'm on the run, and Jezebel's coming to get me. And what's God telling him? He says, Be, he says you know what? I've got 7,000 people out here that you don't even know about that I reserved unto me. It's great encouragement. It should be great encouragement. Look back at, look back at Romans. Romans 4, 11, 4. What saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed, not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. You know, the, 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 the spiritual lesson there is, is just fantastic. You know, as saved people, sometimes we feel like we're alone, we're the only ones. As dispensationalists, people that understand the Word of God rightly divided, we oftentimes feel like we're alone. As people believe in the final authority of the King James Bible, we often believe, feel like we're all alone. Think about there are churches... There are churches teaching prosperity gospel out of Matthew, Mark, and John. They got thousands of people in their church today in this very, not Wilsonville, but in Portland. Oh, there is one in Wilsonville. Uh, there's two in Wilsonville, I think, actually, that have over a thousand people in attendance today. It can be very discouraging. But let this be the encouragement what God told Elijah. I've received it. There's others out there. Just because you don't know about them. Not one person in this room came to right division because they heard me teach it. I've said for years, between Portland and Seattle, what, six million people, eight million people, whatever it is, and I would meet with a little group in Vancouver, about 12 of us, and I'd say, there's only 12 people that understand right division in these two metropolitan areas. Well, that's not right. And there's probably some issues about outreach that I could learn there. But there are people out there, I didn't know about any of you guys six years ago you guys didn't know about me but we're there it should be great encouragement that God's word will work God, God's in charge Richard Jordan said something one time if, if you know Richard Jordan at all if you've seen any old tapes he, he, he was one, he was a uh, well in his own words he was ready to fight at the drop of a hat and if nobody else would drop the hat, he would drop the hat. You know, he'd like to get out there and and do it. And it, it, it occurred to him one day. He said, "You know, I'm not in charge of the church of body of Christ. That's God's responsibility. And God will do. What's God doing today? He's building the church of body of Christ. Right? It's not dependent on what you do or what I do." God's going to do it. So even when we feel alone, when we, it looks like we're alone, we need to remember God's got a plan and it's going to work out. There are others. The issues of right division. 
people will tell you, and I'm sure you guys have all heard this, well, you know, this started with Darby. This started with Scoville. It's only a teaching that's been around about 80 years, 100 years, 120 years. Well, I would dare say that Paul was a dispensation. I would dare say Jesus Christ was a dispensation. Noah was a dispensationalist. Brian Ross did a study for the Grace History Project, tracing the history of the Grace Movement from the time of Paul to today. His last interview was, was with, with Richard Jordan. But in that study, he talked about a group called the Paulesians back in the Middle Ages. Paul Ephesians. We don't have any records of them because they got wiped out by the Roman Catholic Church. So all we know about them is what the Roman Catholic Church tells us about them, right? The victors write the history. What they say about what the Roman Catholic Church says, says about the Paulesians is that they discounted the entire New Testament except Romans through Philemon and they threw out every book in the Old Testament except for Isaiah. That's what people say about me. That all I care about is Romans through Philemon. Never study the Old Testament. Never study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Never study Hebrews through Revelation. So where was dispensationalism back in the Middle Ages? It was right there. It's God's responsibility to marshal, to protect, to build the church body of Christ. We just need to figure out what God's doing and get along with it. Get on with doing what God is doing. We need to learn that lesson that Elijah did. It's not me. The issue is not me. Right? Elijah, look, look at the power that Elijah had. He called to God and God brought the fire of heaven to earth. Gets a little phone call and he runs. I'm all alone. Yeah, you and God. <laughs> They're pretty good odds there. But when we feel alone and discouraged, we need to remember it's God's program. This is what God's doing. We continue to do what, what we're to do in light of God's doctrine for us today, and God will make it work out. What, how was God? Did, did, is it their divine intervention today? Absolutely, there it is. He takes you from being in Adam to in Christ. That's the greatest miracle you'll ever see. He's protecting the church of body of Christ. He's building the church of the body of Christ. He's getting ready for this. That's how God's intervening today. So don't, don't let the discouragement that Elijah felt get to you. And trust me. I walk in here and the room's empty until three minutes before we start. I'm a little discouraged. <laughs> I understand the discouragement. And we have a thriving Grace Church here in Wilsonville, Oregon, compared to a lot of places in the nation. You know? So I wish we had 700 people in a room. That'd be great. But we got, what, I can't count that higher. What, eight of us? <laughs> Four or five on Zoom? You know what? We have a fellowship that a lot of the people in the rest of the world, let alone just America, will be jealous to have. The group in Seattle is four without a teacher. What's my point? God has a plan and it will work out. And we need to rest in that. Rest in that. That God's got other people out there. Because it's God that's going, that, that it's God's plan that's working out. It's not our plan. Because we all know, right? We wouldn't run the church of body of Christ. We wouldn't run the dispensation of grace like God does. Right? We'd have, we'd be full on into legalism now if it were up to us. Well, if you're going to be in the member of the church of body of Christ, you got to leave it up to God. Just do what God's telling us to do, and God will make it work out. And we don't need to have that discouragement that Elijah had. And that's not why Paul brought it up here. But there's the, there's the spiritual lesson that we can learn that it really needs to get into our hearts and understand we're not alone. There's others out there. God's word will not return void. It is not of none effect. What time is that? Okay, we're about there. Uh, look at verse 5. Uh, Even so at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election 
of grace. And this is a, a, a time-sensitive verse, if I can put it that way. This is an early Acts verse. Okay, he's, he's telling is that there, there is still part the election, according to grace, there is still members of the little flock alive. Okay, at the time that he's talking about there. And they're not cast away. They're that, it's, it's a remnant according to the election, and that election is the little flock. We've, we, we've looked at those issues before. So we'll, we'll end here in verse 6. If by grace is no more works, otherwise grace is no more grace. If it be a works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Guys, grace and works can't be mingled. Can't be mixed. It's grace or it's works. That's what I was saying earlier. If we ran the dispensation of grace, we would find a way to make it about works. Well, if that person was really saved, they wouldn't fill in the blank. I'm saved and I don't do that. How can they do that if they are saved? grace or it's works. When you get a paycheck, is it because your boss is just has so much grace for you that he says, here, you don't need to come in today. Even if you have paid vacation, that's not grace, right? You earn that. But there is grace. It excludes works. Completely excludes works. If you add work, we're talking about the deeds of the law now, if you add works to, the, to grace, you make grace is not effect. But if you add grace to the law, you make the law of not effect. What's the issue with the law? There's a penalty. You get you get pulled over by a police officer for doing for speeding. You deserve the ticket, right? Now sometimes the officer will show you some grace. But then what did that do? And not write you the ticket? I wouldn't know about that, but it, all, all that did was take the teeth out of the law. Look over at Romans 4. <sighs> Romans 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. Okay, if, if, if you want your, this to be based on your work, then, then God can do that. Right? If, if, if you want to live a perfect life, Romans 2 will tell you, God is in debt to you. You live a perfect life, God owes you eternal life. But it's not of grace, it's of your work. You did a work, that, that, that your boss owes you a paycheck, right? Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Again, both these verses are just like he says over there. It's either grace or it's works. It cannot be both. By, defi by definition of both grace and works and the law, it can't be both. You're either forgiven by grace, the Lord of Ephesians 2. Either saved by grace or or you're saved by your works. You either stay saved by grace or by your works. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 8. And by the way, you stay saved by grace. <laughs> Just in case that wasn't clear. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of any work, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? If it's of works, then it's of debt, then you can go to God and say, God, I did it. Look how good I am. You owe me. Now. I say that with kind of a mean little attitude in my voice, but you know, there have been people that have made that claim on God and they've been correct. 
Rahab, right? The prostitute over in uh, uh, Jericho, not Rahab. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Israel comes in, the spies come in, and she says, okay, I'm going to hide you, I'm going to protect you, and I expect that you will protect me. And what happened? They protected her, right? Because she had a claim on the Abrahamic covenant. She did what the Abrahamic, as a Gentile, she did what the Abrahamic covenant said. Queen of Sheba. She came. (coughs) She tested Solomon. And she said, wow, it's not a quarter of what I was told. Or what I was told was only a quarter of what it's like here. She gave Solomon gifts. She blessed his God. And what what did Queen of Sheba receive? A huge blessing coming back, didn't she? Seraphonician woman we talked we talked earlier. Jesus didn't want to talk to her. She's a Gentile. She acknowledged her position and who he was and who Israel was, and Jesus rewarded her with faith, didn't he? Because at that point, this is then Jesus on the planet. She has a claim on the Abrahamic covenant. She did the work. She understood the Abrahamic covenant. She understood who the Lord Jesus Christ was. She gave testimony to that. And as a Gentile, she received blessing in a program when Gentiles didn't have direct access to God. So God is faithful to his word. But that's not the word that we have today. It's not our works. It's God's grace. If you'll simply believe what his son did on the cross, God says, I'll give you, I'll justify you, I'll give you righteousness, and you'll have eternal life. And I'll keep you saved by that same way. Because if you couldn't save yourself, what makes you think you could keep yourself saved? If you weren't good enough to do the first part, how can you do the second part? And I mean this literally. Thank God it's based on him and not on me. That'd be rough. Okay. Okay. So we'll pick it up then next time in uh, chapter 7 and and work our way on down. Um, But again, today I just wanted us to be very clear about Israel has been set aside, has been cast away, and now Paul's going to deal with that last issue about what what does it mean that they're cast away? And like he said, he said, but the individual Jew can still get saved. Paul's the evidence for that. Okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love and for your grace. Uh, We just rest in your grace, Lord, that that our our salvation and and our, our sanctification is all based on grace. If if we'll just walk as you tell us to, if, you, if we'll just get in your word, walk after the Holy Spirit, uh, that you'll do a work in us. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll change our, the, this, our, the, this stone-cold heart that we have, make it a fleshly heart, and that we will be able to live a life pleasing unto you. Again, not through any great toiling or working on our part, but just by understanding who we are in Christ, uh, living and letting the life of Christ live out through us. We thank you for the encouragement that when we are discouraged and we do feel like maybe we're alone or we're the only people here, that we know that the Church of Body of Christ is your responsibility, that that you are doing something and that your word is not of none effect, that what you've set out to accomplish, you will. And it's not dependent on on us. There are things that that you would have us to do, uh, but ultimately we can just rest knowing uh, that you you do have others according to the election of grace. We do thank you for the fellowship that we have here, the time we can come and meet and <coughs> just enjoy one another's fellowship and fellowship around your word. In your son's precious name, Lord. Amen. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns? See, we don't need stinking April to do this.